Uh, welcome everybody to day three. You guys made it. Uh, the title was very long. It had a lot of multi words in there, multi cluster, multi region, multi tenant. So I tried to simplify it. So today we're going to talk about uh, reliability and mesh and kind of how they they work together, or at least I'll try. Um, there is a link, and I'll remind this again, if you want to talk to me or if you want to talk to any of our Google product managers, uh, if you go to this link, you know, if you have questions after this, or if you just want to, you know, shoot the breeze, talk about service mesh, uh, feel free to do that. I want to keep the conversations open. Okay, so when we talk about service mesh, we really talk about these three things. I know you've heard it for the past two days. We talk about observability and how great it is with metrics and tracing and topology. We talk about security with authentication and MTLS. Uh, and we talk about advanced traffic management with the whole canary deployments and blue green and circuit breakers mirroring traffic and all of that stuff uh, but there is a fourth tenet to service mesh which is often misunderstood and, and quite often overlooked actually and, and that is reliability so today uh, i thought what i would do is spend a few minutes talking about some of the implications on, on reliability and how service mesh can help uh, and we're really going to just look at certain architecture patterns and because i'm a product manager at google i'm going to look at some architecture patterns on google but make no mistakes, these can apply kind of across the board anywhere. We're going to look at some simple stuff, and then we're going to build upon those. And within those architecture patterns, we're going to look at things like, you know, multi-cluster, multi-region, multi-tenant, and how do, how do all of these facets kind of work together to give you a reliable architecture? So that's kind of the agenda. We really can't talk about reliability without talking about these two words, SLIs and SLOs. So a quick definition, SLI stands for service level indicator. Many of you probably already know that. And that is a quantitative measure of how you perceive the service to be healthy, right? So some sort of an some sort of a level that you think is is a healthy measure of that that service, and that could be latency, it could be throughput, it could be availability, or something like that. And then SLO, which stands for Service Level Objective, is your goal. So that's you take that indicator, you take that metric, you take that signal, and then you define a goal around it. Usually it's a, it's a windowed goal, you know, for the last hour or for the last day or for the last 100 requests. So for example, in this case, you know, 99% of these RPC calls will complete in less than 100 milliseconds within a day, right? So there's, there's usually a window defined and then you put a goal in there and then based on that, that's what's considered to be a healthy SLO. Uh, I bring that up is because I want to get a little bit non-abstract and talk a little bit more from the context of SLOs when we talk about uh, talk about these architecture patterns and we're going to explain this with dice uh, now this inspiration i got from uh, one of my friends's talk at slo conf last year steve mcgee if you have not seen it i highly recommend you google slo conf and and listen to his talk uh, and i kind of put this into pictures but let's imagine that you have a six-sided die and uh, i want to talk about availability so let's just say that describes some sort of a system or a service and when you roll that die if it rolls anything but a one, it's considered available. If it rolls a one, that's considered an outage, right? So one through, or two through six, available, one is an outage. So in other words, you can say that, you know, 83.33% of the time, that system is going to be up. That's its availability SLO. And one sixth of the time, that's the failure rate, right? So 16.66% of the time, the system is gonna be down. Not a great SLO, but works for our example. So that's good. I think a lot of you may have heard this analogy. Uh, I want to talk about aggregate SLOs because systems are very seldom, you know, singular things. They're usually a combination of collection of systems, and we got to kind of talk about it. So we're going to do this with more dice. So here I have four dice, and all of those have the same SLO, right? So 83.33%. Uh, they're colored differently because they're representing one system, right? So you can think of them as, as subsystems, represents a bigger system. And what I mean by that is that these are interrelated. So what that means is if any of these dice go down, the entire system is considered to be out, right? So think of that as, as a service chain where service A talks to B, talks to C, talks to D. And for, in order for that request to be successful, all services must be up all the time. So at and, and this point, what would be the aggregate SLO? So I'm going to throw some math, some formulas at you. And so the aggregate SLO is simply you take the SLO and you multiply them together, or you can take the SLO if they're the same in this case, uh, you just raise to the power of the breadth or the depth, whatever word you want to use. Uh, and hopefully you can make this observation that the SLO went down considerably. I mean, even though it wasn't great before, uh, but when you have these collection of subsystems that are all interdependent upon each other, the collective or the aggregate SLO of that system is very low, right? So it's right now it's at less than 50%. 
And that kind of makes sense because when you roll one dice, there's only one chance that it's going to, you know, it's going to roll a one. When you roll four dice at the same roll, the chances are much higher that one of them is going to end up with a, with a one. Uh, so kind of keep that into, you know, into, into perspective. So let's make it a little bit non-abstract. So let's say you have now a service and let's, let's give it some semi-realistic numbers. And let's say that services SLO is 99.9%. .9%. That means it's available 99.9% .9 of the time, whatever window you want to choose. Uh, so a real world scenario of this kind of a multi-service architecture would look like this. Client talks to service A, could be a front end, talks to B, talks to C, talks to D. And in order for that request to be successful, uh, all of these services must be up. So again, using that same math, we're just going to simply multiply the SLOs together. And then you get this SLO of 99.6%, uh, right? So it's a little bit little bit lower than 99.9%. Uh, this is something where you know I like to kind of think of it as these services are kind of serially connected, and the entire serial system must be must be up. Uh, I think some nerdy way of looking at it is this isn't the intersection model of ways of connecting services. Uh, I simply just call it the bad math, right? This is the bad math, and and you're going to hear me refer to that throughout this presentation. Uh, but this is something you know we want to avoid, or you know in some cases obviously can't avoid, or we want to look at these individual subsystems as what we can do to improve their SLOs. So now let's look at a different pattern. Uh, so let's imagine that there are four dice, but in this case, all four dice are the same, right? So they're all green. Uh, they represent one thing, but there are now four instances of it, right? And what that means is the outage is considered when you roll a, a one on all four dice on the same roll, right? That's much harder, right? If I roll four dice, the chances of all four of them rolling a one is much, much harder. So there's a new formula that defines that, and that is uh, one minus the failure rate raised to the breadth or depth, right? So in this case, it's one minus 0.166. If you remember that, only one sixth of the time each of these dice is down. And since there are four dice, it's raised to the four. Uh, but now hopefully you've made the second observation, which is very interesting, is that the SLO of the aggregate SLO of this collected system is much higher. It's actually we've gone from 83.33% to three nines, over three nines in this case, right? That's very good. Right? This is something we want to do. This is kind of the we're starting to kind of get into distributed systems and, and this is this is looking good. Right. So a non-abstract example of that would be the same service, but let's just simplify that. So it's just one service, but now I have four instances of that service running. Uh, and in this case, the same SLO, it's 99.9%. .9%. And what this means is that, you know, I can lose one, two, or three instances of this service. As long as I have the other service running, you know, I have not taken the service down. Now, I'll, I'll give a caveat that I'm oversimplifying this. There are, you know, I'm looking at this in a very hermetically sealed environment. There are lots of other factors, coordinated errors, there's dependencies, there's network, there's load balancing. Uh, but just from the sake of simplicity and math, there's also capacity planning. Uh, let's just look at it from a mathematical perspective. And again, using the same formula, uh, there are 11 nines. So I, I put that disclaimer out there that this is not that we should be swimming in nines and stuff like that. This is, again, looking at a very mathematical way. Uh, it also assumes that all of these individual services have absolutely no correlation to each other, which in real world is sometimes not the case. There's something at the very bottom, something inherently connecting them together, and so you can have kind of coordinated failures. Uh, but there's, anyways, there's a lot of things that this doesn't take into account, so just kind of take it with a grain of salt. Take it from a mathematical perspective that statistically speaking, when you have this uh, you know, I call this the parallel model, uh, or the the nerdy way of saying that is, is the union model, is that your aggregate SLO actually goes up compared to the individual SLOs, where in the serial model or the intersection model, the aggregate SLO goes down compared to the individual SLOs, right? So this is what I call the good math, right? Just for the sake of this conversation, we'll we'll call it the bad math and the good math. The bad math, when things are connected in serially, and your aggregate SLOs depends upon every single piece, every single subsystem to be to be alive. The, the good math is where you have instances of this and any multiple instances can go down as long as the fourth instance is up in this example and it can handle the capacity and it's living in this idealistic world where it's not dependent upon anything, uh, you can technically get, you know, let's say 11 nines, at least mathematically speaking. Okay, so enough kind of abstraction and let's actually talk about some cloud deployment models. And I, I'd like to start with some kind of real world examples. Uh, here's that disclaimer again. I'm going to get into kind of real world architectures. By no means am I recommending these. Uh, take of the take them as kind of food for thought. Take of take them as kind of inspirations on kind of how to build maybe your next models for various services. Not every service needs the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of kind of like ops benefits and cost benefits and anal analysis that you have to do. Uh, but hopefully it will give you something to ponder over. And like I said, I would love to have a conversation. So let's look at uh, a start into let's say your cloud journey. 
So this is a fairly common pattern, right? So let's say you have a web service that calls some sort of a data backend. That service is in the middle of the page. That's service A. Uh, and let's say just for the sake of sim simplicity, it's running in some runtime. It's running in a VM. And that VM is in a single zone in a single region. And it talks to some database. In this case, let's say it's Cloud SQL. So the request would be a client comes in through some sort of a load balancer, then talks to the service, and then that service talks to the Cloud SQL database. Uh, now I've put some SL, SLX numbers. These are the SLA numbers that Google publishes for their services. So for example, the SLA for GCLB that we publish, and I've put the SLA link underneath, or you can just literally Google GCP SLAs, and that'll take you to that page. So I'm taking my source of truth from there. So the GCB, GCLB, which is the Google Cloud Load Balancers, SLA is 99.99. A GCEVM, a zonal GCEVM is 99.5, and a Cloud SQL instance is 99.95. Those are the SLAs. We're just going to use that, and we're just going to call them SLOs just for the sake of this mathematical uh, idea, right? So when you look at it visually, you can also see for this request to pass, uh, GCLB must be up, the service must be up, and the Cloud SQL must be up. So this is the, the bad math. So we're going to do the bad math. We're basically just going to multiply these three SL. O's. And you can see that our overall aggregate SLO for this system has gone down just a little bit. Uh, now, one thing, uh, observation that I've also noticed is the aggregate SLO will always be lower than your lowest SLO, which kind of makes sense, right? It's, it's the lowest link in the chain. So in this case, the lowest SLO is 99.5%, which is the zonal VM. And then so your aggregate SLO is just a little bit lower than that. So that's 99.44%. Uh, I'm going to throw a bunch of architecture patterns at you. So I'm going to keep score here on the on the on the left-hand side of the screen, right? So single zonal VM, basic web app, talking to a backend, going through a load balancer, 99.4%. Again, all the disclaimers in place, a lot of factors here, but again, we're just looking at this in a, in a very kind of a statistical model right now. Uh, so then you say, okay, well, I need some redundancy within my compute environment. And then so you go into kind of maybe like a managed instance group, or you essentially just run your service in two different VMs. And you throw these two different VMs in two different zones, but within one region. So in this case, uh, and by the way, the other two things are exactly the same, right? So GCLB is still four nines, Cloud SQL is still three and a half nines. In this case, you have uh, we have an aggregate SLA for that model in the middle, and that is four nines again. Right, so now now we're we're improving, right? So we've added this parallel math in the middle, and then the serial math still kind of goes across, right? And that parallel math has already been done. So that's that's the four nines that I've already written underneath the GCE regional VMs. So again, we're we're just going to do the serial math. So we're just going to multiply these numbers, and now you can see that the SL uh, SLO, if, if we're just calling that availability SLO for this subsystem or this aggregate system, has gone up, right? So now we have we're above three nines all again, just by just by adding that additional VM. So that's good. You know, we're getting there. And then you take it one step further. You say, well, you know, regional re redundancy might be something that you need for this service. It's a very important service, and we need to run it in multiple regions. So all I've done, again, not changing the GCLB, not changing the uh, Cloud SQL. Now we've just replicated the same kind of a two VM per region model into two regions. Uh, and you can obviously replicate that to you know all 30 regions in Google Cloud or even other clouds. Right. And we've already done the math for the regional VMs. That's four nines. Uh, in the middle, the, the kind of the purple box and the and the green box, the two regional VM boxes, they're forming the good math, right? They're parallel because you can lose a region and the other region will still maintain. So the first thing we can do is just kind of do that parallel math in the middle. So that's one minus the failure rate. So that gives you, I don't know, eight nines, I think. And then we can do kind of the collective serial math across. Uh, and you know, we're getting a little bit better. Right. So we were at 99.93. And then we added this other region, and now we're at 99.94. Now here I'll make another observation. So the observation is that the higher in nines you go, the harder or the more expensive is it gets to start kind of encroaching closer to the to the hundred percent. And technically, you can never really get to hundred percent because there are kind of infinite, you know, increments that you can kind of take this in. But you can kind of see that we've doubled our regional, you know, redundancy. But we've already gained, only gained like 0.01%, right? So it might be worth to you, maybe collectively as a service. Not the point of this conversation, but just to, just that observation that uh, the more nines you try to add, the cost gets exponentially higher and higher, right? And um, we'll revisit that later. Okay, let's not talk about VMs. Let's actually talk about Kubernetes because that's that's what we all love and and like. So same model. Now we've decided that okay, we're going to containerize this service and we're going to run this in Kubernetes, right? So. Again, we start very small. We start with a single zonal cluster, region one, zone one. And because Kubernetes VMs, you know, typically if you're using a standard GKE cluster, they run just in VMs. So it's the same SLO, right? Or in this case, the SLA. 
So if we just do the math for this, you just multiply the three SLAs. It's the exact same actually SLO if you're running it in a single zonal Kubernetes cluster versus a single zonal VM, because technically they both run in the same VM. So it's the exact same number. That's that's fine. Right? We've done this. We also have something called a regional Kubernetes cluster, a regional GKE cluster, which essentially just runs you know multiple control planes, multiple data planes, and multiple zones within a region. So it kind of gives you that same concept of you know VMs running in multiple zones like we did. And that aggregate for uh, SLA for a regional cluster is 99.95, so that's good. And then we can kind of do our math, and now we're at almost at three nines, right? So just going from a zonal cluster to a regional cluster gives you better, better availability, and we kind of know that. And then just for food for thought, right? So what would happen if we had two zonal clusters within the same region? So you know, if you make the argument that that's kind of the same as a regional, regional cluster, well, not really quite, right? Because in this case, you have two API servers, right? So I, I, I always say you have two chances to get something right, right? Whether you're deploying a configuration, making a change, deploying an application, you have two points of ingress in this particular one from a config standpoint, right? But we can also just kind of do the math here, right? So we know a single zonal cluster's SLO is 99.5%. So we can do the good math because you can lose any of these. So that gives you, you know, four and a three quarters nine. And then we can use, do kind of the good math. And we're above three nines. So at least mathematically speaking, again, I'm not telling you to go do this, I'm not telling you to stop your regional clusters and start going to zonal clusters. That's not the point. But even kind of technically speaking, it kind of makes sense to me that separate clusters, complete separation of clusters, complete isolation boundaries from a impact surface or a blast radius perspective, of course, should give you a little bit better resiliency than a single kind of system that can fail as a system. Now you have two systems that can fail. So now we're above, you know, three nine. So that's good. Uh, and we're going to kind of replicate that to two regions, just like we did with VMs, right? So now we have two zonal clusters in region one, but in two different zones, two zonal clusters in region two, but in two different zones as well. And those are in the middle. So that's the good math. We already in the previous slide did the math for the two zonal clusters. So that was 99.9975. So we're just going to do the another good math on top of that. And now we get, you know, I don't know, eight or nine nines. I think these are nine nines. So running four zonal clusters in different zones and in different regions gives you a fairly good from a gke perspective a very very high uh, you know slo and then if we do the collective slo now we're at four nines All right so we've, we've kind of built hopefully you're keeping score on the left hand side that was the best way for me to me to kind of keep score so whether you're running it in vms or kubernetes you know eventually you get to something like this running this service uh, and even multiple services in in a multi-cluster uh, so I wanted to kind of build up to that, that, you know, multi-cluster is not, you know, not something from the future. You know, it's it's here. We can absolutely do this. And we can do this for multitudes of reasons. We sometimes split teams by clusters, environments by clusters. In this case, I'm just showing you a different lens, which is you can also use multi-cluster for resiliency, right? So you can run your services in uh, many, many clusters. Let's try that experiment. So often I talk to customers and essentially what they do is they have multiple clusters, but they're running different services on different clusters. You can think of them as like they're running different tenants or different teams. So they give every team their own cluster. So just for the sake of simplicity, let's just say that every team just runs one service, right? Just to do the math simple. So I have four clusters, the same four clusters. It doesn't really matter where they're running, but I have four different services running. So A, B, C, and D. Uh, and we know a single zonal clusters SLA is 99.5%. Now. Imagine that in this particular example, these tenants are very tightly coupled where all services must be up for the aggregate SLO to work. So now I have to do kind of the bad math in the middle. All right, so I just have to multiply them. Again, it's an assumption. If these were completely independent systems, then you know this, this doesn't apply. But let's say service A talks to B, talks to C, talks to D, that type of a scenario, and you have these cross cluster communication constantly happening. Well, now again, since we're doing the bad math in the middle, you can see that our SLO has dropped considerably, right? We're down to, a, we're, we've lost a nine actually, right? In this case, like we've gone from two and a half nines to 1.89, right? Or something like that. And then we have to still do the bad math on the overall system and then we've lost even more. So now we're down to 97.99%, right? Again, food for thought. I'm not saying you should go around and just stop giving clusters to teams. There are other valid reasons to do that and they totally make sense but just from a purely mathematical reliability perspective these are interesting interesting observations that i had and i thought i would share with you and and i wanted to compare those last two ones right so on the left hand side we have four cluster 
but the same service or in, in the future I'll show you services running in those four clusters. And on the right-hand side, we have these kind of single tenant clusters, if you want to call them, where you only have one service running. And we've already done the math. So on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, uh, you can see that we have, I don't know, nine nines. On the right-hand side, we have the 98%. And just to, again, we're just doing, we're just having fun here. Like we're not, we're not, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to scare you or anything. But on the left-hand side, with the nine nines, you get you know less than 50 millisecond of yearly downtime versus on the right hand side where any of these pieces can go down. It's, I, I kind of look at it as like a Jenga, you know, it's like if one of these pieces is down, the, the whole thing is going to topple over. Uh, you can have up to 14 and a half hours of monthly downtime. Again, take it for take it for what it is, take it with a grain of salt. There's legitimate reasons to put services in different clusters. That is not what I'm saying, but all I'm saying is that you know there's something to be considered uh, when we're talking about reliability. Okay, so this model, this kind of a four cluster, you know, two zonal clusters in one region in different zones, two zonal clusters in region two in different zones, and then you can replicate that to as many regions as you'd like, and obviously the number will go up. You can also replicate the, the number of clusters to multiple zones. That's, that's a capacity conversation, but a good starting point, even if we just start with this four zonal cluster, is something we internally are just calling multi-regional distributed services. And I've, I've capitalized or you know, cap-cased cap distributed services and that's distributed services just means a single Kubernetes service that runs in more than one clusters. Right? That's that's all it means. So in this case, service A is not, it's a Kubernetes service, but it's also a distributed service because it's running in more than one clusters. Okay, so I've, I've talked for about 20 minutes and I have not mentioned the word mesh. So let's talk about why mesh is important in this entire thing and where Istio kind of fits in. So in real world, you will not have a single service, obviously running in multiple clusters. You will have multiple services running in multiple clusters in multiple regions, in multiple zones. So now you can see kind of where that whole multi-cluster, multi-region, uh, and multi-tenant, you can imagine that these services or groups of services are just different tenants. So in this case, it's the same thing. I've just kind of laid it down horizontally just so it visually kind of sits, sits nicer. And I've just added four services uh, to each of these, right? So now what do we need? What does Mesh provide us, right? It provides a service discovery. It provides a secure routing. It provides us observability, which is very important for distributed services because I want to kind of see the holistic view of what, what these services are. Uh, and it provides us, uh, you know, security and traffic management, right? So this is where things make kind of more sense when you're in the multi-cluster space, when you, when you are looking for locality load balancing and such, stuff like that, right? So this is where uh, certain considerations uh, I want to just kind of talk through and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. So first, what, first one is locality. Anytime you go into multi-region, you do have to start thinking about how is my traffic being routed? You know, because now you have the same service geographically spread across multiple regions, especially if you're in more than two regions, then it becomes even more important. Uh, so in this case, let's say region closer to, cl uh, you know, uh, closer to region one, clients closer to region one, you want to send them to, you know, healthy instances of services running in region one, clients closer to region two, you want to send them to healthy instances of services running in region two. Well, Istio provides that. Istio has a concept of locality load balancing, and we can use that to make sure that clients get better performance. So you're kind of balancing both performance and reliability in this particular case. And from a business continuity perspective, let's just kind of take that one step further. When a service fails, so in this example, let's say the service in one cluster failed, one service in one cluster failed, well, no problem. Istio will kind of recalibrate, reassess what's running, and it will say locality load balancing still applies because I have another instance of that service running in a different cluster. Again, this is a distributed service. Logically, it's the same service. So the load balancer will send that or the ingress gateway will send it back to that. If an entire cluster fails, no problem. All instances or all traffic going to any service will go to that second cluster. If an entire service fails in the region, right, in one region, let's say there was some coordinated error or you pushed up CICD pipeline that just took an entire service down, locality load balancing will fail over to the next region over, right? And the last one, if the entire region fails, now regions, I don't think typically fail, let's hope not. But let's say there was a configuration issue, some networking configuration in the region failed. Same thing. All traffic for all services will now go to the next closest region, and Istio can help you kind of do that. So I put that in the in the bucket of business continuity. Uh, and so locality and business continuity can kind of work together. And by the way, when everything reconciles or everything recovers, everything reconciles back. 
Uh, application lifecycle management, I think this should be self-explanatory. I have four instances of this service running. This is what I was talking about, is you have four chances to get this right in this example. So service A, version one is running. I want to introduce a new version of this service. I can do that by just introducing that in one of the four clusters, let's say, or I can do it in all four. It just depends upon your strategy. And I can send a very small percentage of traffic. Now, Istio can help with that because we have weighted traffic distribution. Some people call this the, the canary method of deploying. But now I'm doing this in a more progressive way. So progressive app delivery, which is the ability to slowly introduce a new version of an app, is something that Istio is very, very good at. One of the things that often gets misunder uh, mis understood even or overlooked is the infrastructure lifecycle management, right? So let's take these four clusters. I've actually purposefully removed the services. The clusters themselves have a lifecycle, right? They're pieces of software, right? And they need to be upgraded and maintained and stuff like that. So there's a couple of strategies, right? So, and internally we do this too. So you can remove all traffic from one of these clusters. Let's say you want to upgrade cluster one, GKE one. You can drain that cluster, which essentially just means I'm going to just remove all traffic from that cluster. This is again where that advanced traffic management of Istio comes into play. Spill all that traffic to cluster two, let's say in this case. So performance doesn't make sure that you know the capacity is there, but you control that knob. Once all the traffic is drained, I can now upgrade that cluster. And then once the cluster has been upgraded, I can put the traffic back onto the new cluster. I can test it, I can mirror the traffic, make sure everything is good to go, and I can control the infrastructure lifecycle management. Another strategy is I can simply not touch the old cluster at all, introduce a new cluster that has this new composition of, you know, let's say the new Istio version, the new GKE version, and then I can slowly, gradually ramp traffic onto that cluster and test it. That's where observability comes in, right? And observability, I want to do it from at a service level. I don't, I mean, I still want to do it at the infrastructure level too, you know, that your cloud provider is providing that. But even at the service level, I want to make sure that that observability is there. And that's where the observability piece kind of comes in is like, I want to monitor the SLO of the service, individual services, and I want to make sure that they stay above the line that I'm, I'm doing that. Um, as you're pushing traffic onto the new cluster, you can start to drain one of the old clusters. And once the old cluster is gone, you can essentially, you have your back to the same thing. Now, those are both very viable strategies. The first one is operationally a little bit simpler. It's the same number of clusters. The second one is more complex. You have to think about IP spaces. You have to think about load balancers. I totally get that. But I just wanted to put, put out two strategies that you can use with Istio to make cluster lifecycle management much, much easier. And I've seen both uh, in the wild. Okay. So the last kind of elephant in the room is this idea of single tenant clusters or services that just cannot be multi-tenant because I've been just kind of pushing this idea of like make every cluster multi-tenant and that sometimes is not a reality. Uh, so let's take that use case. So yes, the way I think about it is one of the principles I think about it is that you should make the clusters as much multi-tenants as possible because that's where the cluster lifecycle kind of makes sense. That's where the outage scenarios kind of make sense. That's where you get the good math, right? Right now I'm running all four services and all four clusters. I'm taking advantage of the parallel you know, intersection, the good math, right? But let's say service D cannot exist. So there's a couple of ways to do that. Obviously the most obvious one, and I, I always look at the most simplest way. So the simplest way is let's say service D cannot coexist with other service. I'm going to remove all instances of service D from all other clusters and remove all instances of all other services from the one cluster that service D lives in, right? So in this case, GK4 is now a single tenant cluster only running my single tenant services. And there are very legitimate use cases for that, right? The PCI services or any kind of regulatory compliant thing that you need to run. Uh, but this is not good because now service D is kind of the single choke point, right? Especially if you have service D's, service D becomes a dependency on the other services, right? So Another way of looking at it, and I know I'm kind of like think, making things a little bit more complex, but I think this is the, this is the whole point of, of you know, the invention or the inception of Istio, is I can kind of have the same model, but just kind of replicate it, right? So I have these multi-tenant clusters, sets of multi-tenant clusters, and I can do the good math on that. And then I have these sets of single-tenant clusters, which are the same, you know, so one, two, three, four are my multi-tenant clusters, five, six, seven, eight, same region, same zone are my single-tenant clusters, and I can run that. And now I'm kind of benefiting from, uh, from both, right? So th that's kind of it for me. I just want to kind of leave you with some final thoughts. I was thinking about how to kind of close this up and uh, you know, I'll just kind of ramble and then we'll take some questions. Uh, I think we have a couple of minutes. So first thing on reliability. So remember I talked about two kind of facets of reliability, uh, the good math and the bad math. The important thing to think about is there are multiple subsystems. And what's important is not to just focus on one of those subsystems. So what I'm saying is that you know at certain point, GKE is good enough, Kubernetes, 
subsystem is good enough, move to the other systems. How do I now make Cloud SQL better, right? How do Maybe I should move to, to Spanner. Maybe I should move to a much more resilient database environment. How do I make my networking better? Networking is always kind of the choke point. So, you know, you start thinking about how to equally kind of raise the individual subsystems SLOs. Right? Uh, application management. In multi-cluster land, it's much easier to make decisions at a per application level Right, and decouple that from infrastructure, right? So when you have multi-cluster, you can upgrade applications completely at the same time in parallel with upgrading your clusters, right? The draining, the spilling kind of works the same way as you're introducing new services onto clusters and slowly and gradually ramping traffic on those, on those clusters. And then on tenancy, uh, again, my decision tree, simply, simply put, just thinks that every service should be multi-tenant, until it cannot. It shouldn't be the other way around where we say like, you know, let's just put all services in different clusters or have no kind of objective reasoning behind this. So a good way to think about it is, can this service live in a multi-tenant environment? Let's amortize the reliability of that subsystem with multiple clusters and stuff like that, because it gives us much better control on application lifecycle management, as well as on infrastructure lifecycle management. Uh, so think about tenancy in that way. Again, if you think about multi-tenant, you can always have a single tenant clusters, right? But you can't go the other way around, right? Uh, Istio provides you service discovery automatically, no CRDs required, provides you routing, no CRDs required, provides you secure connectivity with MTLS, not a problem, gives you kind of aggregate SLOs, right? We here at Google have a product called Antho Service Mesh. And the reasoning behind that is that the life cycle of Istio itself sometimes can be challenging or something that you just don't want to deal with, right? So if you want to learn more about that, again, I'll put that bit.ly link. So it's just bit.ly slash ASM chat 22. So if you go to that link, it's just, I think it's like four questions. Uh, I, don't even, I don't even think any of these are, are mandatory. And what that would give you is just a, a 30 minute, you know, face-to-face -face or you know, virtual face-to-face -face talk with one of our product managers where you can ask us Istio questions or ASM questions or any questions that you might have. So with that, thank you so much for your time.